Hello and welcome to My Career in Data, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Mona Rocky Bay, the co-founder and CEO at Telmai. With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launchpad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DVTALKS for 20% off your purchase. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity and this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management, to understand how they got there and to be talking with people who help make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Today, we are joined by Mona Rocky Bay, the co-founder and CEO at Tomai. And normally, this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest, but in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. Mona, hello and welcome. Thank you so much, Shannon. Hello, good afternoon. What a fantastic Friday evening to be with you and talk about my journey. Oh, I'm so excited for you to be here and to learn about you. So you're the co-founder and CEO at Telmai. So tell me about Telmai. What's the company about and what is it that it, that the company does? So Telmai is a data, observable, a data observability company that me mm-hmm. and my co-founder, Max Lukic, have started um, almost two and a half years back. Um what data observability is that we look at the data using our machine learning, statistical analysis, and we extract insights about the data that tells us about the health of the data, and we constantly monitor that. Uh, the company is, as I mentioned, two and a half years old, but uh, we have built it out very rapidly. We have customers like Merkle, um, Clearbit, Data Stacks. We have built a partnership with GCP data. Databricks, uh, Snowflake, and so on. Uh, the product has already been loved. We have great re- uh, reviews on G2 and also were leaders in the GigaOM report for data observability. So uh, seed stage, uh, so far I've raised eight and a half million seed round of funding for Telmai and um, uh, we are on a roll. Oh, that's exciting. So congratulations on starting this business. I can't wait to hear until we get to that point. So, but tell me, as a as the founder and CEO, I'm sure you're wearing many hats at this point. So, what does your typical work week look like? Uh, this is a very interesting uh, situation in an early stage company, specifically like Telma. There's a lot to do always. Mm-hmm. And specifically with the role of a founder CEO, it cuts across many different dimensions and many different business units of Telmai from operations to sales to uh, marketing, because we don't have such a built out team in all these different functions. So uh, first thing, my primary focus is to make sure that we build a strategy for the company. That's number one thing across like uh, specifically around the product market uh, fit. Uh, once we set that strategy, there is a tremendous amount of distractions that can go in a startup's world. So how do we make sure that we set the focus areas for the team month over month, uh, quarter over quarter, so that we are all aligned and march in the same direction and reduce the noise and focus on the signals uh, that we need to uh, focus on. So those couple things are high level. And how we deliver this is through a good culture and good team. So one of my key roles is to hire uh, mm-hmm. and the right team who are super top in what they do because at our stage it's very difficult to execute if you don't have the right team so the right team and the right culture and keeping that momentum having said that on a tactical level if I just have to look today I had a meeting about legal contract review sales negotiation like it's all over the place discovery call um And somebody told me very beginning when we started the company, you have one role, which is uh, to both of us, me and Max, founder role. And that role is a very different role. You got to do whatever it takes to move the ship forward. So 
it is a very overloaded term it's a very complex thing i did not realize what that meant till i really started it's literally anything that comes your way right or outbounding sure. talking to people whatever it takes to get this uh, ship moving constantly oh but how exciting and how fun to to put all of your passion into this and and build that up it is it is absolutely and i feel fortunate that i even have the opportunity uh congratulations again so let's let's back up a little bit before we get into the the why and when you started so so tell me Mona is this what you wanted to be when you grew up was this the dream say I'm going to be a CEO of tell my when I grow up and I'm going to co-found this company on <laughs> <laughs> what was the dream? <laughs> so, so this is super funny, Shannon, because I am born and raised in a very small town in India. Uh, uh -huh. Or it is not super small, small, but it's definitely not the big city. So uh, to put it really straightforward, my dreams also couldn't reach where I am today. So my dreams were humble back then. If I had dreamt about being a working person growing up, that itself was a big thing. So being mm -hmm. a co-founder, CEO of a tech company is something that I don't think my dream would have reached back then. So mm -hmm. I have done my dream long ago. <laughs> so it was a very humble dream. So I've come way far ahead for, from that part. So, yeah. Oh, wow. So, so tell me about that. So growing up, so then where, when did you uh, start um, uh, evolving your education and what did you start focusing on as you got older and start creating those dreams? Yeah. So, so a little bit like I've grown up in a family where like my mom was a homemaker, my dad, uh, mm -hmm. a, a government agricultural officer. So a lot of the town where, where I grew, Nasik, uh, there were good colleges, but the engineering colleges were very tough to get in and specifically computer science was a hard one. So I definitely did my graduation in computer science. Uh, programming mm -hmm. is something that I liked, specifically was good in the logic behind programming um from there on i stepped out of my town to a, a bigger uh, city pune where i did my masters in computer science that itself was a big step like uh, kind of reasoning out with my dad that it's the right thing to go to go to leave the home and not have an arranged marriage and like <laughs> look yeah. out for my career uh, and then onwards, getting my first job, which was uh, on campus, much bigger than what uh, I could have imagined or what my father could have thought that I would uh, do. So uh, that's where my career started. I got my first jo job as an engineer, started working as a developer in Java, J2A. From there, uh, started moving. I was a risk, risk taker from the beginning, like moving out from my town and stuff. So that was one thing that always came along. And then I took another big risk uh, of moving to US, like with not too much cash, not too much money as like, okay, let, let what, what worst can happen? I don't like, I don't find myself settled. I'll come back again. Like things won't go that bad. So here I was with a couple of suitcases and now uh, came to US and then uh, again, continue to work here, join companies like Oracle. Back then, I was still working as engineer in uh, Java uh, side. Slowly, what I realized that my my inclination was more towards customer empathy, solve, using technology to solve problems. Mm. So then mm -hmm. I started pivoting towards like understanding how the product is used by customers and move towards quality engineer quality engineer and i started actually doing functional uh, quality assessment like using the product how customers would use started writing about that at oracle uh, complex product uh, capabilities breaking it, them down into how customers would use it slowly that kind of carved out my path to product management which was one mm -hmm. of the big pivotal change for my career and I started moving more and more towards customers so much that I used to love doing this day in a life of customers. So basically taking a technology, mm -hmm. uh, but spinning it around, looking at the why part of why will this technology even be re relevant? Why would somebody care about this? Like, are we doing it just to innovate or are we doing it to solve some real problems? 
And that's how from uh, like uh, I was uh, heading Oracle uh, BPM product um, suite move helped move to the cloud, then joined a startup. Right after that was my entry into the startup world at a master data management company called Reltio. I was the founding product manager. Mm -hmm. That's where I entered the startup world, which was so fascinating, to be honest. It was so amazing. The pace at which I could make a change in a startup mm -hmm. was awesome. Like the, the whole thing that I mentioned, working closely with customers, that was all 10x in a startup, right? Like you have a problem, you just get stuff done there is no waiting for anybody there's no like just just move so uh, i was i joined there as a founding product manager grew into heading their platform the company was early stage and i was with relteo till its hyper growth into its unicorn status uh, and so on uh, after that the startup is what i i got the bug right so when i quit relteo <laughs> I, I, I'm a mom of two uh, daughters, by the way. So when I quit, I I, I, I quit Realty and I thought I wanted to take a break. And my co-founder called me and he's like, you know, this problem we were working on and we kept seeing at Realty and other companies, let's solve it with AI and data science. And I have this amazing idea. And as I told you, I'm a risk taker, right? So it yeah. took me exactly two minutes. I had a two-year-old back then <laughs> at home. Most people would be like, I have so much going on, but... I was like, you know what? Let's do it. <laughs> like, let's just start a company. I don't overthink these things. It felt right. The yeah. problem is something I knew. Uh, yeah. I, I told you it's important to have the right team and stuff. I knew this person. I knew the problem. Uh, and I, as always, I was like, what is there to lose? Like, yes, uh, of course, there's things I could over. I could calculate a lot of things, but uh, it feels right. The industry needs this. We have an idea, novel idea to solve it. So let's go for it. So that's really how my journey was through engineer turned product manager turned founder CEO. Oh my goodness. That's quite the journey. So let me ask you a couple of questions. So it, I, so I'm so impressed, you know, that you were so confident in yourself. You knew what you want. You stood up for yourself and said, no, hey, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go get my master's. That's that's so impressive. Um, it it takes a lot, you know, to to do that. And, and I don't know if that's risk taking as much as just uh, confidence and, and self-awareness of who you what you wanted to do. Yeah, it's both, honestly speaking. Yeah. I'll tell you something, but you're scared, like everybody else. Sure. Right? Yeah. And you're confident outside, but you know that you're fighting against your parents and your family. So you have additional pressure to prove what you did was right. And it was, mm -hmm. uh, it was meant to be, right? Like um, I had that extra pressure of like going back to my dad and saying that, Hey, that was the right thing to do. See, good, good thing you send me out and everything yeah. worked out. And you're you're also paving a path for others who want to do the same thing. Yeah, so it may seem on the surface being confident or confident, but that also uh, is a little bit of a scary thing. <laughs> oh, it certainly, I'm sure it was not easy. So confident, yes, but maybe a bit hard, a hard thing to do. So, but, so that's really impressive. Um, and so what was the catalyst then too that made you decide you wanted to move to the US and make this other big, huge, and this was certainly a risk, you know, moving to another country? Yeah, so a lot of it was opportunities, right? Uh, it was a lot like uh, we, I was engineering and back then, now my husband, I, I was dating him. Uh, he He's also in tech and we both were thinking that, it is time to kind of get out of our smaller pond and explore what we can do beyond, right? Uh, uh, more more opportunities being specifically, we were very uh, curious and interested in coming to Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. uh, where a lot of innovation happens, where a lot of advancement happens. And again, goes back to that mindset that, yes, we at, at the most, we will feel that this is not right. And mm -hmm. we will come back. That path is always there. Uh, it might put additional challenges, but best case, we go out and we know that there is something that we wanted. And, and like many immigrants, right? The funny story is like, 
I came on H1B and I, I told that, look, my family is here, your family is here. We are not going to renew our H1B. We'll stay for three years. We'll experience a new country, a new way of working. We'll be in a faster paced, more innovative uh, place. And then we can, we'll go back. But that never happened, right? <laughs> you know, that, that three years and no renewal, that never happened. This is home now. Yeah. Uh, I have kids build a company I I feel like we did a lot for ourselves like here we uh everything said and done the this country is awesome for the amount of uh, support we received as first generation immigrants here from career perspective from opportunities perspective it, it was fantastic oh that's so great more and more companies are considering investing in data literacy education, but still have questions about its value, purpose, and how to get the ball rolling. Introducing the newest monthly webinar series from Dataversity, Elevating Enterprise Data Literacy, where we discuss the landscape of data literacy and answer your burning questions. Learn more about this new series and register for free at dataversity.net. And so then tell me then a, bit, a little bit then, so you had this conversation with your with Max, your partner, to talk about this problem that you wanted to solve. So you just decided to jump in and and um, that's, you know, sometimes that just people, I think, freeze at that moment and, you know, but you dove in and you just, you just did what it took and now you have seed funding and that is amazing. So uh, just to go after that and. Yeah. So that journey was the immediate, yes, was super fast. And then mm -hmm. the rubber meets the ground, right? Then yeah, you have to really start making things. You have to uh, get the company registered, start talking to people, fundraising, bootstrapping, like putting our savings into getting the prototype ready. Mm -hmm. Because until you put and show that really we strongly believe in this so much that we both quit our jobs, both of us like... Although I had quit a little bit earlier, Max also quit. And uh, both of us were at peak of our uh, careers where we were at that point. And we had a strong convinci conviction. Now we had to work towards it. So we started doing, we first built out a prototype. Um, then we realized that when we are building an AI-based product, the funding mm -hmm. is needed because uh, you need to uh, bring in some data science engineers. This is uh, hard to kind of just bootstrap with our own saved money. So at that point, we started fundraising. Uh, we also got into Y Combinator, which also mm -hmm. uh, gave us seed money, but also gave accelerated our learning curve as found founders. So we were in Y Combinator Summer 21 program. Uh, the same time we got into Y Combinator, we did a pre-seed round with Dot 406 Ventures and De Zeta Venture Partner, both are data infrastructure and AI first uh, investors. Uh, with that money, we were able to build out the product, push it out. Now, again, there's a lot of ups and downs, right? Like uh, fundraising is hard. Getting the first customer is super hard, super. I, I mean, I, I thought I knew so many people, but it is hard for anybody to put their job online for somebody who has a great vision, but uh, we sure. have to for those early adopters and that's not at all easy it was a tough one you have to go talk to people prove out that your vision uh, about the product is real but once you get those early believers then you have to prove out a lot more in terms of the product and because they have put their jobs on the line you have to make sure they are successful and you make them look really good in front of their company so all of those things started like as we moved on uh, a startup life, there are challenges. We had team uh, partially in Russia, the Russia war happened. So we had to overnight change a lot. Our team was almost brought down to engineering to couple engineers and we had just onboarded uh, like large enterprise customers. So uh, a lot of some of these challenges started. But one thing what happens very quickly in an early stage uh, company like Telma is that you learn to adapt to these challenges very quickly and you mm -hmm. develop a mindset of how do I solve this and move on quickly and not get stuck up and thus, oh my God, why did this happen kind of a mindset. So 
we kept doing that uh, we embraced that and um, uh, by within even before company turned two years we had three large customers we had uh, earlier this year we built all these partnership and now we are on a super good growth momentum so so with those ups and downs in the end um, with the right team with the right vision we were able to kind of do a lot in these two years two and a half years uh, so tell me then with all these different changes and um, risks that you've taken what has been your biggest lesson so far in your career uh, from a career pers perspective, uh, my well, the way I would say, Shannon, is that if you go by a typical corp, especially I've worked at large companies, the way a growth chart is built, it's based on statistics and data, right? Most people, they become an engineer after that senior engineer. If they like the individual role, they can continue to be a top class engineer and uh, or an architect, or then you pick the other uh, ladder, which is like people manager and stuff. They're, but often people get caught up in that and feel like that's that's the path they have to go with. But that's not the truth. You have oftentimes you have to look inward. What is my personality? For me, that was the moment. Right. I I love technology, but. I loved solving problems with technology, right? Now, there was no path like this to figure out, right? I So I, when I started getting signals, I, I just kind of moving a little bit lateral here and there, QA, uh, product manager, data company. Uh, if problem solving is what you like, then and if you're in a little, little bit of a different ladder, then you need to figure out how to get out of that ladder, right? Because the org structures are not designed for you. They are designed on the masses and statistically designed, right? So sometimes you have to carve your path outside of that. So that's that's my learning. If I had tried to always figure out how fast I can go through that chart, I would have missed these opportunities. Oh, that's really, really good advice and, and, and a really great lesson. Um, so, you know, especially then too, as you, uh, as you're hiring people um, in data, um, do you see the importance of data management and the number of jobs working with data increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years and why? I think it will increase uh, and incre increase dramatically because there's a lot of sentiment in the industry that data and AI will take jobs. But I look at it differently. AI will make jobs easier. Uh, AI will make things faster, cheaper, better what you are doing now which means that the human skills of like analyzing thing differently putting a little bit of empathy will become a very premium thing right uh, and mm -hmm. you use ai for everything i i am i use uh, data for everything all decisions all whether it's marketing product decisions which what what should we do what features should we do let's figure out like what does the data show? What is the user feedback show? What does uh, our research show? So th there's data there. What? Where do we focus on mar marketing efforts? How do we segment our market? That's again data driven, right? So data is going to be everywhere. People who adapt data driven mindset will, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, will definitely have a premium. Will have a lot of room to grow and continue to grow. Problem solving with data will also be very crucial. So I do feel like uh, the importance will, of data will increase. The jobs will be there. The focus should not be so much specifically on the tools, but on mm -hmm. the tools and technology because they constantly evolve. Just in my career, uh, there's there has been so much of evolution. The focus should be on problem solving with these tools and data and if you master that then uh, everything around can keep changing but your skill set will never go out of uh, fashion or whatever <laughs> <laughs> that's really important so you know and you mentioned data and how you use it all the time and and uh you know it's it's a key component to your your company so what is your definition of data so my definition of data is exactly something that helps you what you do 
mm -hmm. faster, cheaper, and better, right? That is my simple way of thinking about data, but there's so much complexity in that faster because now you have data to make decision and not just like hypothesis. Now you have some information that can help you quickly drive your decisions. And everybody's impatient today, right? Everybody wants, I mean, think about the time when cloud came, right? The adoption curve was so like, it took its own sweet time for everybody to adopt it. If you mm -hmm. think of generative AI, in, in November, we all played with open chat GBT, open AI. And today, so many companies are already have production models and like everything has become fast. And then data helps things get even cheaper, right? Like because in terms of now, uh, we have the technology to make decision faster, cheaper and better. The, our bar for better has increased dramatically, right? Every... Even for startup our stage, people expect top-notch service, top-notch product, everything, right? And I feel data gives us these three things uh, in general at every level. That is really a great definition. And I really, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, so then, Mona, uh, you know, especially as, you know, an employer, what advice would you give then to people looking to get into a career in data? in any aspect yeah so so first thing is data is here to stay ai is here to stay so the sooner we all kind of accept that fact and start learning and getting our skills updated and at every level we have to do it even uh, at my level i have to always be two step ahead of what is happening on technology front. so i would definitely advise everybody to embrace that uh first thing data is here to stay ai is here to stay so build that skill set uh and when I say skill set, sometimes it's not so in important that you start coding and doing everything, start learning every single data, um, data science algorithm. But what you need to know is what, how do these things uh, apply to what you are doing and how can you mm -hmm. solve what you are doing with the use of data, data science, and then the technologies will evolve and you have to keep learning. So uh, my top advice would be like, embrace this start leveraging uh, some of the modern technology start up updating yourself with what's happening in the ai world uh, especially generative ai we did that at telmai we have like a hackathon and we are trying encouraging everybody to constantly see what can we do what we are doing better with ai um, it doesn't have to be in our product and as a part of our product but it could also be like co-pilot and how can we write better test coverage uh, using AI and make our lives easier. So really embrace that uh, mindset. That's that's great advice. And, and so tell me, what, how do you keep up with the latest technology and what's happening in tech? So I definitely read up uh, most of the time. So I, I read up, I used to read books before a lot but now I mm -hmm. either uh, listen to books uh, that helps mm -hmm. me kind of do multiple things together I I, I follow uh, folks whom I feel have a good point of view um, mm -hmm. whether it's in data science and data itself so uh, who have a clear articulation who have good customers uh, customer driven approaches to explaining solutions so I follow that I feel those are easier way to consume sh uh, shorter nuggets the other thing that I personally like doing is I like to write blogs for tell my myself, at least the outline. Mm -hmm. And that enforces me to do a lot more research, right? It's a forcing factor. And I have a personal objective of at least getting one or two blogs out, which means, and I pick a topic which I should research. So let's say when large language model came and there was a lot of hype around it, what is the impact of uh, data quality on model training? Now, that's a topic I knew there is impact. I knew as somebody who's in the space that there is going to be impact of bad data on how you train your model, fine tune your model. So I said, why don't I write it? And if I'm writing it, I have to do a very thorough research. So that then I start reading about it and then I start following few authors. And then so it kind of puts me in this forcing factor kind of a thing. And by the end of it, because I'm writing about it, I kind of develop a subject matter expertise and point of view on that. Oh, very nice. I like the multitasking. <laughs> <laughs> it's so great. Multi-purpose. 
Yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, Mona, um, this has been so great. So I'd be remiss if I didn't ask um, if people wanted to learn more about Tamai, where would they go? So our website, um, .ai, which is getting updated uh, in the next couple of weeks, we'll have much more. But there's a, a lot on Telm.ai. I'm very accessible on LinkedIn, I individual, because as I told you before, I love talking to people. So I'm one of those people. I have another kind of uh, thing that I like to do is like people, especially in the data space. So uh having at least four or five meeting with new people and just understanding what their pain points are what they are learning about what they are seeing in their use case in their world is something that i absolutely derive a lot of insights from so easy i'm relatively very easy to get hold of on linkedin and stuff uh so but learning about tell my uh, www.tem.com uh, tem.ai my bad uh and we have blogs under that and we keep writing about topics in the data reliability space, data observability space, also about data science and how we use AI to do what we did traditionally in a diff differentiated approach. So there's a lot on that uh, blog's site of our website. Very nice. And I'll be sure and grab those URLs from you and we'll get them posted on the podcast page as well for everybody. Awesome. Sweet. Well, Mona, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. It's been a joy getting to know you. Thank you so much. Alan. I'll stay in touch with you. But this was really a good conversation. I hope my journey inspires. I'll leave you with one, one closing th uh, thought. I, I, I'm a pretty mediocre person uh, in every which way. And that's why I I hope the audience learns this, that do not try to pattern match you with others, because that's very limiting. Uh, if you're trying to look at people who's, who are Stanford dropout or MIT dropouts or MIT grads who are building stuff, or that's not the case because anybody, the message that I would like people to do is like, just carve out your own path. Uh, uh, there's no pattern here for, especially for starting things and not to say that I'm super successful or anything, but at least carve out your path of your career. So specifically, since you're doing this for career for people, I think that's a useful thing to walk away with. Oh, such sage advice. And and thank you for, for saying that. So that is that is our hope. <laughs> there is no straight path in data. There's no straight path in any career. And it's so true, just following your passion, following being true to yourself. And as you say, carving your own way. It's, it's, yeah, you don't have to follow the plan that's mapped out for you. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of us just try to pattern match with others. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't always work. No, I wish I had learned that a lot earlier in life. <laughs> I, wish, I wish the same for myself also. Like a lot of time I kept like comparing and thinking, yeah. but yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that's one thing I would tell even my daughters, like it's your path, it's your journey and don't try to match it with others. Oh, what a great note to end on, Mona. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Shannon. It was such a pleasure talking to you and good luck with everything. Uh, likewise. Uh, and to all of our listeners out there, if you'd like to keep up and up to date on the latest podcast news and the latest in data management education, you may go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Until next time, stay curious, everyone. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks, a podcast brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Thank you.